Morning, Christian family. A uh, quick reminder about the hats, if you have one, if you could please take it off. And then uh, on the screen, we were able to fund with what we had, along with $179 additional, two more individuals for the Christian education system over there. Give, post those. And uh, the grade schools didn't all record their numbers. So right now we're at 1754, but I believe it's going to be a little higher. I'm going to turn over our worship then to Elias. Good morning. It's a privilege to be able to worship with you today. We'll begin with the confession. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We, we justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. For Christ died and we were buried by Christ by our baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we may also live new lives. Rest assured, brothers and sisters, your sins are forgiven. Amen. Amen. We'll now think, sing three stanzas of the hymn, Chief of Sinners, Though I Be. Brothers and sisters in Christ, today we'll focus our attention on the story of Manasseh, whose story is recorded for us in 2 Chronicles 33, verses 10 to 20. It's a story that illustrates the transformative power of God when we humble ourselves, repent, and align our lives with God's will. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they paid no attention. So the Lord brought against them the army commanders of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh prisoner, put a hook in his nose, bound him with bronze shackles, and took him to Babylon. In his distress, he sought favor in the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his ancestors. And when he prayed to him, the Lord was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea. So he brought him back to Jerusalem and to his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord is God. Afterward, he rebuilt the outer wall of the city of David 
west of the Gihon Spring in the valley, as far as the entrance of the Fish Gate and encircling the hill of Ophel. He also made it much higher. He stationed military commanders in all the fortified cities of Judah. He got rid of the foreign gods and removed the image from the temple of the Lord, as well as all the altars he had built on the Temple Hill and in Jerusalem, and he threw them out of the city. Then he restored the altar of the Lord and sacrificed fellowship offerings and thank offerings on it, and told Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. The people, however, continued to sacrifice at the high places, but only to the Lord their God. The other events of Manasseh's reign, including his prayer to his God and the words the seers spoke to him in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, are written in the annals of the kings of Israel. His prayer and how God was moved by his entreaty, as well as all his sins and unfaithfulness, and the sites where he built up the high places and set up Asherah poles and idols before he humbled himself, all of these are written in the records of the seers. Manasseh rested with his ancestors and was buried in his palace, and Amon, his son, succeeded him as king. To fully understand this portion of scripture that we just read, we need to understand some context. Earlier in chapter 33, we can find a record of all the ungodly practices that Manasseh engaged in during his reign as king. He set up Asherah poles, he engaged in divination, and he built many uh, altars for the false gods. Verse 6b says, He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. Manasseh's actions were grievous in the sight of the Lord, and as a consequence, he faced captivity and affliction. Now, let's bring this story a little closer to home. Here at KML, how might we be building altars for false gods? Are we becoming too entangled in the snares and demands of this world, prioritizing our desires over his will? Perhaps we're devoting too much time seeking our identity or aesthetic instead of placing it where it rightfully belongs, in Jesus Christ and him crucified. Or maybe our focus on extracurricular activities takes up too much time that we could be using for personal Bible readings or... Um, devotions. What about our presence on social media? Who's our target audience and who are we following? I'd like to invite you now to do something you normally aren't allowed to do in chapel. If you have your phones, pull them out and go to your screen time settings. I have directions up there where you can find that. And then if you're comfortable, share your screen time settings with the person sitting next to you. I'll give you about 30 seconds to do that. All right, let's rein it back in now. You can put your phones away. But maybe a f more than a few of us realized when we were looking at our screen times that we were holding an idol in our hands. Our phones are designed to steal our attention. Oh dear. We'll just use this microphone. Our phones are designed to steal our attention, and we must really make time to keep our schedule open for the important things. Um, maybe that starts by setting a wallpaper on our phone with a Bible verse. Maybe we ask Alexa to wake us up with the verse of the day, or even listening to Wells Daily Devotions on the way to school. I, I hate to circle back to phones, but if you asked a stranger who was walking down the sidewalk, if you were a Christian, just in passing, would they able, be able to tell? Or how about somebody even sitting next to you? Would they be able to tell that you're a Christian? Furthermore, let's compare ourselves then to Manasseh in leading the people of, the people of Jerusalem astray. Are we able to tell by others' actions that we're Christians? Just as Manasseh faced the consequences of his disobedience, we must acknowledge the consequences of our sins. The more comfortable we get with our sins, the more excuses we begin to make for them, and the more we wear down our moral compass. It's not long before what we once knew as wrong is becoming commonplace behavior in our lives. 
We must strive then to live by the words of the Apostle Paul when he writes, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Thankfully, when we stray, the law reveals our shortcomings and can lead us back to repentance. The beauty of Manasseh's story here in this portion of scripture is that it doesn't just end with eternal judgment and damnation. During his captivity, Manasseh humbled himself and repented before God. He confessed his sins and sought the Lord's forgiveness. And in his boundless mercy, God forgave Manasseh and brought him back to his kingdom in Jerusalem. This is the core of the gospel message right here. Redemption, forgiveness, and restitution even when we don't deserve it. Manasseh certainly did not deserve the forgiveness that God gave to him, but in God's boundless mercy, he was able to send his son to live the perfect life and die the death on the cross. Isn't, aren't we lucky that we get to call God ours? We continually sin like Manasseh. We build up false altars and focus on the things that are not really important in our life. But when we humble ourselves, repent, and turn to God, he embraces us with open arms. It's not the severity of our sins that matters, but the sincerity of our repentance that really matters. This portion of scripture is a powerful reminder that no matter how far we've strayed, God's grace is sufficient and his forgiveness covers all. After his repentance, Manasseh embarked on a journey of sanctification. He removed the idols, repaired the altar of the Lord, and encouraged his people to serve the one true God. This inspires us to do the same. In our lives as Christians, sanctification is the ongoing process of becoming more like Christ. Humble repentance is the starting point, but living as a Christian means constantly striving to align our lives with God's will. Let's consider how we, too, can cast aside the idols in our lives. For some of us, maybe instead of tearing each other down, that means we work on building each other up. For others, maybe we change our music or clothing choices, and maybe others, we work on... Excuse me. We work on encouraging others to follow God. It, it looks different for all of us, so how will you respond to God's forgiveness? If you take anything away from my chapel message today, I want you to remember this, that the story of Manasseh is a powerful reminder of what repentance can do, that God's grace is sufficient for us and it's a beautiful thing, and that sanctification is an ongoing journey that we as Christians engage in. It's not something that we're required to do or told to do. It's something we do as a response out of thankfulness for what God has done for us. If you take, just as Manasseh fulfilled God's will after repenting, we can only imagine what God has in store for us when we humble ourselves, repent, and daily play to an audience of one. As we depart from chapel today, may we reflect the love and the forgiveness to our, of God to our teachers, classmates, and a world in desperate need of his love. Amen. Let's pray. Take all the failures, each mistake, of our poor human ways. Then, Savior, for thine own dear sake, make them show forth thy praise. Transformed by grace divine, thy glory shall be thine, to thy most holy will. O Lord, we now are all resigned. Amen. We will continue then for the blessing by singing the only stanza of the doxology. Thank you for coming to chapel today. It was a privilege to be able to lead you in worship. Now we are going to do the class counts for spirit wear and all that fun jazz. So, yep.